After accepting this uh, invitation to be here today, I had a little anxious moment trying to decide what aspect of my 35 years in photography to talk about. And uh, of course, I have 12 uh, photographer friends from National Geographic, photographers who have spoken on this TEDx or TED stage before. So I wanted to find a subject that was different, that hadn't been talked about before. Well, I was sending an Instagram picture to my Facebook page, and I got an idea by accident, by chance, so to speak. Anyway, so uh, I'm on assignment for uh, a uh, cell phone company, and I'm in New York City trying to find a picture in the pouring rain. Uh, I'm crossing 42nd Street on a red light, and these two buses just pull up right in front of me. I look down the sides. I see the advertising on both sides. I rush down the middle and click. I take this face-to-face -face picture. I then uh, put it on my Facebook page uh, and pressed share. Now, look at the comments I'm getting on this photograph. Everyone wants to discount the, fact, the, the, the luck factor. I call this lucky red light. They all attribute this photograph to my skill with a camera, my hard work, my professional eye. Nobody wants to talk about the luck. So I was on to something here. I started thinking, this is worth talking about. Why is it? Why is it that no one wants to talk about luck? Perhaps because serendipity, uh, good luck, good fortune is, seems out of our control. If you've spent a lot of time and effort trying to uh, make a goal, whether that be a great photograph or winning a race or uh, doing a, a, an amazing business deal, no one likes to think that it was all because of an accident. But I believe photography depends on it. It's what separates photography from all other visual arts. Uh, painting, drawing, sculpture, all depend on control with a skillful hand and an artful eye. I also believe that, that luck can be controlled. You can do things to influence that luck. You can control chance. So let me show you some photographs from uh, a story I did for National Geographic on the epic travels of Marco Polo. All right, so here I am in Venice, in uh, Piazza San Marco. It's this square from which Marco Polo left for his trip to China. And 25 years later, it's where he comes back. Now, my job is to photograph those two columns there at the end of the quay. They were erected there in the 10th century, so Marco Polo saw those columns when he departed in 1274. But how do you make a picture of a place that's been photographed a gazillion times before? How do you make that fresh and interesting and compelling for your audience? Well, here's my first try. So uh, I noticed these pigeons on the square and I had my assistant throwing pebbles to get him to fly, <laughs> filling that empty sky and giving a sense of movement. But I had another idea. Now, National Geographic photographers on tight budgets and limited time in the field, in reality, do not like to leave anything to chance. So I knew by my research that the world's biggest 
cruise ship was going to come into the harbor to stay in September. I knew it was going to be there at 9 a.m., and this is the picture that I had in mind. I thought it would be a, a very uh, awesome picture spread to juxtapose this big boat against this, these two columns, dwarfing those two columns. But uh, so we were waiting there at 9 a.m. I knew it was going to be coming in and anchoring down the canal. But of course, this was Italy, and the boat was late. <laughs> so as I was waiting there, two uh, carabinieri came over and told me I couldn't put my camera there because I didn't have a permit. Now, uh, I whispered to my Italian uh, assistant, Marisa, who happens to be beautiful, blonde, and talkative, to talk to those two guys, chat them up, charm them, convince them to let us stay. So uh, this went on for about 20 minutes, but still no boat. So just as they were getting tired of the small talk and were about to kick us off the square, the boat enters the scene. Everyone turns to see this humongous ship. I clamber up the ladder and start shooting, and the ship blows its horn. All the birds take to the air, and I get this picture, one that I never imagined I would take. That's what I call photographer's luck. So uh, next I go to Genoa to photograph the location where Marco Polo wrote his famous book. He was incarcerated there after being captured in a naval battle between Genoa and Venice. And uh, his roommate just happened to be a romance writer by the name of Rusticello who ends up ghostwriting the book. Now, how lucky was that for world history? Anyway, so my job is to shoot the, Piazza, the Palazzo San Giorgio. Well, when I arrived, it was raining. Now, photographers are used to dealing with weather, which is, as always, out of our control. And sometimes we can use it as an asset. But not this day. I didn't see any potential for a photograph, so I went into a trattoria for a plate of pasta. And uh, after an hour, I finished my espresso and headed for the street. And to my surprise, the sun was shining. I looked down at my feet to dodge a puddle, and I see the facade of the palace reflected in the water. And just as I raise my camera to shoot, a bird flies into the frame and click, I get this photograph. Photography depends on the serendipitous moment as part of the creative process. And Japanese photographers recognize this. They call this shutter chance. So, uh, <laughs> I follow Marco Polo next to Iraq and Iran, and I find myself in the village of Minab, close to the Persian Gulf. Now, Marco Polo talks about the people who live there as being black, the descendants of slaves. I also knew from my research that the women wore a very interesting form of hijab, a red mask with just slits for the eyes. And I thought this would make a very cool National Geographic cover. So I spent the afternoon there shooting portraits, putting my subjects in different backgrounds, against windows, against doors, in different light. and. Uh, I shot 100 frames at least, hundreds of frames, and thought I had some good, but this was the days of film, so I would not see the results 
for several weeks when, until I went back to Washington, D.C. and had this film processed. Anyway, I thought I had some very good, and uh, I was packing up my gear and heading back to the car when I see this woman washing clothes down by a stream. So uh, she looks up at me, and I click, get this frame. I got off maybe one or two other shots before she looked back down to concentrate on her work. We throw out all the other photographs I had taken that afternoon, the pose photographs, and this totally unplanned photo ends up as the cover of my story. The right plot time, right place, right light with the right lens. I next, after three years, I'm following Marco Polo, he ends up in China and goes to work for the next 17 years as an emissary for the Mongol Emperor Kublai Khan and travels all over the empire reporting on what's there. And one of the things he wrote about quite often was falconry. Now, falconry was the sport of the Khans, sport of the Mongols, and it was Kublai Khan's uh, passion. So he knew where, just where to find them. So I started with a bunch of portraits of this guy who I found on the edge of the Gobi Desert in far western China. And uh, so I photographed him admiring his bird, uh, catching his bird, when suddenly, without direction, his grandson shyly enters the scene without his pants on. So, uh, so much better than the simple portraits I was taking, we published this picture, double page spread, a real slice of life moment. Photographers, uh, also try to make their own luck. And uh, we do this by being up for every sunrise and having a location for every sunset, dawn and dusk being the best times of the day. We increase our chances to be lucky by just being out in that light. Here I am on China's Grand Canal at sunset. And uh, I'm set up on a tripod with my longest lens. But how to explain how several hundred yards away, a farmer carrying his irrigation buckets would just happen to walk into the light at what Cartier-Bresson would call the decisive moment. So I was ready with my camera and click, I get this picture. It doesn't get any luckier than that. So next, I'm north of Kashgar, where Marco Polo has just visited the biggest uh, market on the Silk Road. And the weather is out of control. It's snowing in high desert where it never snows. It's the middle of April, and I'm desperately looking for a subject to take advantage of this rare, rare situation. So off to my left, there's a factory, and dozens of workers start pouring out, as surprised as I was to see the snow. And thank God, for the guy with the red umbrella who just happens to walk into my frame. Now, if you take your hand and cover that red umbrella, you will see how this photograph goes from extraordinary to just ordinary. What is it? Divine intervention? Maybe. Photographers wanted big egos, perhaps come from the fact that they think the Almighty is on their side. <laughs> the next picture I'm going to show you is one of my most iconic. It's a picture of Marco Polo 
crossing the Taklamakan Desert. It's the cover of my book. It was the lead picture in the story on Marco Polo. I get there, and you can imagine how disappointed I am because off to the right of this 1,000-foot sand dune are thousands of tourists and hundreds of camels with big numbers painted on the side of the saddles. Obviously not the picture I had in mind. So I hopped back into the Land Cruiser and started driving along around this mountain of sand and to the east side, I saw my picture. As the sun came over the top, throwing those camels into shadow, I backlighted them and underexposed so you can't see that's, that's camel number 22, 44, 85, 69, and 102. You think that's Marco Polo <laughs> crossing the Taklamakan Desert. Those are six tourists on rented camels with big numbers on sign. <laughs> the illusion complete, I did my job. The perfect frame to show Marco the explorer's trip across China. So, if my best work is due to my skill with the camera, should I not be able to repeat this photograph? Should I not be able to take my favorite moments and recreate them? In science, isn't reproducibility the test, in this case, to show, does skill trump luck? Well, I've been back here three times and I've never been able to duplicate this shot. So uh, here I am about four years later and uh, my angle slightly off. I couldn't get back far enough. Uh, not to mention it was very difficult to just find five or six camels now that this place is such a huge tourist attraction. I'm back here again, maybe six years later, this time with a digital camera and I'm carrying a copy of the cover and searching for this exact angle. Well, slightly off, but a better try. But notice that with a digital camera, you can see that these are tourists. They're wearing kind of pink, orange boots, and you can obviously see they're tourists. So I was back there last year with the latest camera, and as you can see in this close-up, it's now impossible with these amazing cameras to silhouette any picture because you see incredible detail even in the darkest shadow. I now look at this, however, as success rather than failure. That first frame, which depended on luck, cannot be reproduced. It proves its uniqueness, and now I travel with luck. I am looking for it. I uh, recognize it and welcome it. So I say to you all, consider yourselves lucky. <laughs> recognize the luck, recognize the moment, and then use it with your knowledge and expertise, use it to produce something. That is the message. Uh, master chance. And as an Asia specialist, there's only, I'm gonna leave you with one other picture. And so the next time you are in Asia, do what everybody else is do. Go to a temple and pray for luck. <laughs> Thank you very much.